Good morning, everyone. We'll see if I remember how to do this. It feels like it's been a while. I'm glad to be back. I was excited this week to get back, and then Wednesday hit, and Thursday morning hit, and I couldn't get off the couch, and had stayed there from the night The Chosen ended. I laid there on the couch and then just slept the entire day all through Thursday. I think I hit about 15 hours of sleep in total. I don't know if it was from camp. It was something from the girls that ga- they gave me after spending so long at camp. They wouldn't leave me alone. I, I don't know what it was, but it was just full body chills and aches. And So I'm glad to be standing up here this morning. And then Shane wanted to do the power washing of the church, so if you notice, the church might look a little brighter on the outside. If you haven't noticed that while you look at the Easter Easter lilies, maybe you'll notice that while you see the brightness of the church as well. Um, But then I was taking the the bags off or the coverings off of the air conditioner, and I stepped down to that shed, and there's a hole out of the shed. And if you've been out of the shed, you know exactly what hole I'm talking about. (laughs) For about... uh, half a second. I didn't know if I'd be here on crutches or not this morning, but luckily I'm good. So it was just a, just a little sprain. It's only a little swelling this morning. So I think I lucked out pretty, pretty well on that, but I am excited to be here and we are continuing our series of the chronological gospel. Um, It's been interesting because we've kind of started getting into kind of matching up with what's going on in the chosen during our Wednesday nights and then what's happening now within our Sunday messages. And so it's really cool to kind of see how these things line up. Um, And this morning we're going to talk about the call of the disciples. I forgot to put the transitions there. But this morning we're going to go through four different stories or four different markings of the first calling of the first disciples. I call it the first disciples because the way it's all set up, if you've ever read through the Gospels, it's not a clear picture of when the disciples were called, how the disciples were called, which disciples were called, when and how, and if they actually followed Jesus, were they the disciples? Um, And so we're going to talk about roughly the first five apostles, the first five men in Jesus's inner circle this morning. And whenever anybody asks me, you know, Josh, I've never read the Bible. Where should I start? If someone asks you that, that's probably one of the most loaded questions in the history of questions. Usually, when someone asks you, where do you start with a a book, you say, in the beginning. Well, it's kind of hard to start with that, and then how's that all work out? Usually, I like to say, start with the Gospels. Well, Josh, there's four Gospels. Which one do you start with? Start with John. John is probably the best Gospel to start with. After John, go through Acts, go through Romans, and then maybe jump back into the Old Testament if you're feeling lucky. But generally, I say start with John. Now, most of us who come from an educated background know you start at the beginning of something. Know you usually start at page one. Page one of the New Testament is, well, Matthew. And so it makes, us, it makes sense for us to read Matthew and then Mark and then Luke and then John. And I think for most of us, that's kind of how we've tackled the Gospels. It's how we've tackled Scripture. It's how we've tackled trying to read through the Bible. But yet, it's not always the easiest way when trying to read through the Bible. I know Genesis and and Exodus make it a little bit easy to start in the Bible. It tells you about the beginning. But then what happens when you get to Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and then you're like, okay, I'm done reading the Bible little patience there is required. But today we're going to start, we're going to start in Matthew, we're going to go to Mark, and then we're going to talk about Luke. Now these three stories talk roughly about the same story. The first calling of the first four disciples. A man named Simon, a man named Andrew, and a man named James, and a man named John. These are roughly the first four, and kind of all according to Scripture, the first four men who followed Jesus. And we'll look into this a little bit here. But our first scripture comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. As he was walking, he being Jesus, along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, 
James the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, preparing their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now I mentioned this morning in Sunday school to Judy, I was glad she was here because we were talking about fishermen this morning. And I know Judy's got some personal experience with some fishermen. And so I figured I would, I would pick on her a little bit this morning. Not too much, I promise. I, I want to make sure she comes back. But all of a sudden, here is Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he spots two fishermen. Judy, are fishermen the most agreeable men? Are they the easiest to get along with? No. And yet here Jesus is, simply says to them, come follow me, and they drop everything they were doing. Judy, do you know of a fisherman who would just drop all of their gear and leave it by the shore and just follow someone? <laughs> and so hopefully this is painting a picture that this is a strange occurrence. All of a sudden, here is this man. He doesn't introduce himself. He doesn't say anything other than follow me. But it says here, immediately they followed. Immediately they followed. Now, if we go back here, there's some grammatical things I want to look at here. Notice it says Simon and his brother Andrew. Is anybody a younger sibling? And so Krista and Gary and Dale are all younger siblings. How often in school were you introduced as, oh, well, this is so-and-so's brother or this is so-and-so's sister? I know my sister absolutely hated that. A lot of my teachers that I had had my sister. One teacher famously said to my sister that she still holds a grudge to this day, says, you are nothing like your brother. My sister openly replied to the teacher, good. I'll let you take that for what you will. But if you're an older brother or a younger brother or sister or you have that relationship, you know how this is. In the next scripture we'll see, it says that Simon, oh, and his brother Andrew, so we know that Simon is the older of the two brothers because he is attributed first. But it's kind of a bigger sign here when it says James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Well, isn't John also a son of Zebedee? But that's just the grammatic part of this story it reveals to us the age in the context of the other two. Usually within that Jewish custom, it was more of the, the younger brother was more of a subordinate to the older brother. What the older brother said, you ended up doing. And so there's also an age range, but also an authority range here. This will also come a little bit later as well. I just wanted to point that out now as we moved along. A little bit of the same context comes when we get to Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. I'll read through this one, then we'll pause and kind of look at the differences between the two that we've just read. As he passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Oh, here it is. Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat putting their nets in order. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Notice when we started this, we talked about the context in which Matthew wrote. And we talked about the context in which Mark wrote. Matthew and Mark were roughly writing to the same Jewish audience. This is why Matthew and Mark are placed at the very beginning of the Gospels. Because the word first goes to the Jew, and then to the Gentile, and then to the rest of the world. This is roughly how the Gospels are arranged, that the Jewish audience is first. And so for the Jewish audience, they would have understood exactly what is happening here. They would have understood that the names are in specific order for a reason. They would have understood the context of these men being fishermen. They would have understood the context of them cleaning their nets, meaning they were end of the day. They were getting ready for the next day to come, and so everything had to be clean, and everything had to be put in order for them to start then the next day. Now, usually, after the end of a long day, would you like someone to come up to you and say, hey, follow me? Usually at the end of a long day, I say, no, I'm going home because my day is done. I can make time for you then tomorrow. I had to make a phone call this week, and if anybody knows me, knows I don't like phone calls. 
I don't like talking on the phone. I don't like the phone as a general construct, but that's, that's my own issues. That's something else entirely separate there. But I do not like talking on the phone because I can't track facial features. Usually you, you send a snarky text message with a little bit of, you know, humor to it, and then, then the other person's like, why are you so mad, or why are you so angry, or why are you so upset, and you're, I, I didn't mean to. Like, I meant to make a joke to my dad, and it came off a little harsher than I meant to, and I had to, I had to apologize to him later. So he said, oh, no, I understood what you meant, but I felt awful after I reread it. I'm like, I'm the terrible son. But seeing the face of a person is what makes a conversation. That's why I don't like talking on the phone. That's why I'd rather speak face-to-face -face with someone. And so having, having the context, having that interaction is a lot better for me. And so I had to make a phone call this week that ended up lasting 35 minutes. Now, sure, when Chris and I were in college, there were times where we'd talk for an hour or two, but that's usually after a week of us not talking at all. Like, it takes me a while to build up that time, time constraint in this conversation. But I knew if I put off that conversation to the next day, because it was a little later than I wanted to make that phone call. It was around 3 o'clock. Usually right around the time where I start shutting my day down, my productive day down. But I knew if I didn't make that phone call, knew if I put it off until the next day, the likelihood of me making that phone call probably would have been a lot less than it originally was. I feel like the fishermen here, James and John and Peter and Andrew, were much the same way. That Jesus said, hey, follow me. And they said to themselves, this man is serious. This man is who he says he is. There is no need to put it off another day. We do it now, or we don't do it at all. This is that same feeling I get from Mark. Mark, is, Mark isn't interested in, in the dialogue. He's not interested in, in how it happened. He's just interested in what happened. Mark is much like the headline pool of the, of the New Testament. He's the headlines of the Gospels. He lets the other Gospel writers fill in the rest of the details. And it is in Luke chapter 5 that we get those details. In fact, I think it was two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, that we got to watch the episode of The Chosen where it talks about this miracle. Many of us know the miracle of, of the fish of there being so many fish that they can't pull them into the boat by themselves and that the fish start sinking and the nets start breaking. Most of us know that story by heart. But this story is in the same context as these last three, or these last two stories. And so it makes a little bit more sense when we get to Luke, who fills in the details that Matthew and Mark left out. But then the question becomes, why would Matthew and Mark leave out such a seemingly important topic? Why would Matthew and Mark leave out this miracle? Because we have to realize the audience. You know the, the common phrase, if you, if you want to tell a community, or if you want news to spread, tell an Amishman. Well, the same is true for a Jew, especially in a small town, especially in a small fishing village. You tell one fisherman, the next fisherman tells the next fisherman. And before you know it, before lunchtime, everybody's already talking about it. Well, the same thing happens in Jewish context, in Jewish culture. Matthew and Mark are writing to Jewish people. They would have already known this story. Luke is a historian. Luke is taking account of everything, writing to every one. And so it's important for Luke to have these details that wouldn't have been known outside of that small community, outside of the Jewish people. And so this is where we get the context of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gesenerat. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put, a little out, to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. I hope this wasn't the first time that Jesus and Simon met. Because I can't imagine coming back after a long day of work, or as the chosen had it, a long night of work, 
you begin cleaning your nets. You're washing up, cleaning up, making sure everything's in order for the next day, and then all of a sudden this man gets in your boat. Hopefully a man you've seen before or have some foreknowledge of, otherwise it's just some stranger getting into your boat. Not just your boat, but your way of making a life, your way of making means, your way of making money for you and your family. Whenever I'm in the car, I drive. That's not to say Krista's a bad driver. Krista just doesn't like driving. Whenever my dad is in the car, he wants to be the one driving. He's gotten a little bit better since I've gotten older. But all this to say that if it's ours, we like to be in control of it. We don't easily like handing things over and letting people take control of it. And yet here Jesus is, Lake Genesaret is the same as the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee isn't much of a sea. It's actually even smaller than, than Lake Erie, I think, if you put it into context. It's roughly just a quarter of the size. And so a sea isn't, isn't a great way to st- describe Galilee. And so here we see Lake Genesaret. But Jesus gets into this boat. Then he sits down and begins to teach the crowd. There's this amazing thing with, with water and, and sound. That if you're out in the water, you can hear for what seems like miles. And here Jesus is, is trying to, to speak in front of this crowd. And the crowd gets larger and larger. And eventually, like me, I don't like speaking too loud. I'm very thankful for these microphones and thankful for Greg to able to produce my voice because it's exhausting talking. I don't like talking. But we see here that Jesus' voice wasn't carrying. And so what Jesus did was took a step back onto these boats so the water could help project his voice. Now, it's not to say Jesus couldn't command a bunch of birds and animals to take his voice and to spread it to all the people, but usually Jesus likes working in more human terms than Cinderella or sleeping or Snow White terms. But he sits down on the boat and begins teaching the crowds, just as a Jewish rabbi would sit in front of the congregation and teach from the Torah or from the scriptures. This is no different than, than that. Jesus is just simply taking the temple out of the temple and putting it to the people. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. Now who here, if for the first time you're meeting a person and they ask you something, do you reply with master? Or teacher? I don't think many of us, for the first time meeting someone, would do that. No, we might reply with the respectful, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, no, ma'am. We may do that, but this is a level even above that. There's already a respect built in here. Now, whether it's from Jesus' teaching that Peter was privy to, that Peter was, was aware of, or Peter was listening to, that might be one aspect of it, but this word master shows a familiarity shows that there is some kind of context already built between these two men that perhaps this wasn't the first time that they met. And Peter replies here, we've worked all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, okay. Judy, are fishermen very set in their ways? They have a routine. Most of us have routines. Most of us don't like going against what we're used to. And if your routine hasn't yielded the results that it usually does, it puts you in a pretty foul mood, doesn't it? Well, I've done this, this, and this, and I've done it this way for years and years and years, and it's always done this. But why is it not working today? Well, all of a sudden, it's not working today for Simon. It's not working. And then all of a sudden, here comes this man who is apparently a speaker, apparently some religious leader. I haven't seen him out here before, so he must not be a fisherman, but yet he's telling me how 
to fish. Now I'm left-handed. People have tried for years to tell me how to write as if I was right-handed. And for years, all my letters ended up backwards or upside down. And they couldn't figure out why. Well, it's because I'm left-handed, not right-handed. And so actually, I had to help teach, reteach Brinley's kind of mind and how she thinks and processes things. Because if you write an S one way, or I'm sorry, one way, I see your hand do that, so my hand does that. Oh, wait, I just made that backwards. Well, if you do it this way, I see your last actions on the bottom, I write it from the bottom up. And people think it's the strangest thing. When I was in school, people thought it was fascinating to watch me write because it looked like I was writing everything backwards. Well, yes, I was, but people don't like taking new advice from people that they don't know. And that's exactly what is happening here. But yet, it yields results. They had so many fish that they had to signal their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled their boat so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell out at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of the fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Now this gives me a better reason to understand why they left everything. Now we have some context and we have the importance that if a man of Jesus, and we know what Jesus does throughout the rest of the Gospels, we know who Jesus is, so I hope if Jesus says, follow me, we're likely to drop everything and simply follow him because we know. But here, James and John and Simon and Andrew they see firsthand that what Jesus says is possible. That they see who Jesus is, is the Messiah, is the one that they've been waiting for. And Simon can't help but fall to his knees and say, go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. He recognized instantly who Jesus was and how powerful that is and how unworthy he is of that. Are we the same way? Because I hope we are. We should be. We should see something miraculous, something from God and say, how unworthy am I? But yet you still choose me. You still choose me. Now I talked about this a little bit. And we mentioned before at the very beginning of this when we talked about the introductions to the Gospels that that John does something different than all the other three Gospels. I mentioned it very early on that John's Gospel helps to put into chronological order the entirety of the rest of the Gospels. I also brought up that this wasn't the first time that maybe Jesus had met the disciples, or at least these disciples. And so with the context that John puts perspective on all the chronological order and brings the word and the relationship of Jesus to the people, as simple as me, as simple as these fishermen were, John's story is a little bit different here. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, this being John the Baptist. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? I find this interesting. So here they are with John the Baptist. John the Baptist mentions the small phrase, look, the Lamb of God. And instantly they knew it had to be the Messiah. They turned from their teacher. They turned from the one who had taught them what they knew. They turned and knew that they had to follow Jesus. 
because John's whole mission was to prepare the way for the Lord, to make straight the paths of Christ. They knew John's message and knew that they had to follow Jesus. Jesus replies, come and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John and followed him. He first found his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter. This is the first meeting between Jesus and Simon and Andrew. Noted is the younger brother going to the older brother to tell the news that the Messiah has come. That's a little unprecedented. But yet at the same time, Jesus also is a little unprecedented. But it is Andrew who is the disciple of John the Baptist, which should show us the dedication to the Old Testament, show us the dedication of Andrew to become a disciple, not just someone who follows, someone who listens, someone who comes every now and then, but a disciple who spends time with, who sits down with, who enjoys a meal with, who learns from. John the Baptist. And then drops all of that when he hears that this is the Messiah. It's not until later when we get into Matthew, Mark, and Luke that we get the call. There is nowhere in here where it says that Jesus says to them, follow me. This is simply, say, this is simply Jesus walking through town and saying, why don't you join me? Or since you're here, why don't you stay a while? You followed me this far, I might as well invite you for lunch. And then more happens. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Now here it might be strange that we have all of these different towns. Now all of these different towns are much like the small towns here. That Fredericksburg is only so far from Shreve, and Fredericksburg is only so far from Moreland, and Moreland's only so far from Millersburg. That's kind of roughly what this is. Now sure, these small towns may not even have a stoplight, may not even have a restaurant in them, but they're also on birth certificates. They're also places of addresses. They're of importance because that's where they are from. And notice that all of these are within a roughly five mile radius. They're all within walking distance. But why is it important that we know these towns? It's because of Nathaniel's words here. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, we also know that Nathaniel came from Bethsaida, which is another small town. Now that must, must be, that kind of put me in, in mind of, you know, we live in Fredericksburg, and so our high school we support is, is Waynedale. And when I was at church camp, I wore a Waynedale sweatshirt. As soon as I came out of the cabin, I saw another kid who wore a triway hat and shirt. And I think his shoes were purple. Pretty sure his socks might have said something about triway. I think the back of his hat had triway on it. I think he might have liked triway. But as soon as he saw me come out of the cabin, he looked at me and his jaw dropped. He went, like I had offended him. How did I offend him just by wearing a shirt with a school on it? I kind of feel like this is what Nathaniel's getting at. 
I kind of think Bethsaida and Nazareth might have had a little football rivalry back in the day. Okay, I know there might not have been football back then, but it was probably baseball. But here we see the hypocrisy of, of Nathaniel coming out a little bit. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Nothing good can be that. Here we have Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Philip is pointing out exactly who Jesus is. He's basically giving him first name, last name, and address here to make sure that Nathaniel knows exactly who we are talking about. And the fact that he points it out that this is the one that Moses wrote about. He's pointing out exactly that we know this. We knew this was coming. We knew this was possible. We knew what the scripture says, and it's exactly how it says it is. This is what Nathaniel is doing. And I love, I love Philip's response. Come and see. Come and see. There's only so much we can tell people about Christ. There's only so much we can do when it comes to witnessing about Christ. At some point, our response can only be, come and see. Or watch and find out. But I love that response from Philip. Come and see. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, about, and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. The line before just kind of trash talked Jesus in his hometown and then all of a sudden here we have Jesus saying about Nathanael, here's one that is a true Israelite, that there is no deception. This is a man who doesn't hide from the truth. And Nathaniel replies, how do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under a fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now this may sound like an amazing thing. This may sound like an awesome thing that Jesus saw Nathaniel under a fig tree. It doesn't say what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. It doesn't say that Nathaniel should have been doing something else while under that fig tree, or during that time he should have been working, but he decided to rest instead. It doesn't say any of that, but I'd like to think there was something there that made that fig tree important. Because if there is no importance of that fig tree, fig trees are pretty common in the Middle East. They're not so as common around here, as was evidenced during our Holy Week. I don't know if anybody noticed it. I didn't have figs. Those were, those were avocados. I hope nobody caught on to that. I just let it go now, though, I guess. So I guess that ruined that experience. But you see, fig trees are common. Sitting under a fig tree would have been common because they provided shade. There's multiple stories of Jesus going to a fig tree for a fig or for rest or for shade. This wouldn't have been a big deal. And so what was happening under that fig tree... What was going on in Nathaniel's mind during that fig tree moment, that had to be the important part. That Jesus didn't just see Nathaniel under the fig tree, but saw him for what was truly going on in his life. Just as he does with each and every one of us. Now I get all that because of this next verse. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? If you think this is amazing, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now we get to that last line. You think, I've been tracking this whole time, but what does this last part mean? Fig trees I'm good with. I've seen trees. I've seen figs. But angels ascending and descending Notice what Philip said when he said about the law written by Moses. This is also a reference back to that. And so Nathaniel would have remembered that conversation about Moses with Philip. And Jesus responds with his own conversation about Moses. If we go all the way back to Genesis, we get to the ladder, or Jacob's ladder where angels ascend and descend between the earthly plane and the heavenly plane. Jesus is referencing that directly to Nathaniel here to remind him of the scriptures, to remind him that he is the Messiah. 
Jesus' words aren't on accident here. Jesus' words are very specific to who he is very specifically talking to. And that's the importance. Notice we come to five disciples. Jesus doesn't just tell them to follow me. Jesus builds the relationship, shows them glimpses of who he is, and then says, follow me. It's at this time I'd usually have Ann come back up as we move into our time of invitation this morning. But Jesus talks to us the same way today. Jesus is building that relationship if we open the door to that relationship. Jesus talks to us in very plain language as fishermen, as people who enjoy sports, as people who enjoy food, maybe people who enjoy a dollar ice cream. Maybe Jesus wants us to sit down and have a scoop or two and reflect on what his word is saying to us today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel that we've always seen as four distinct individual books, but yet when we put it all together, it reveals so much more about who you are and the things that you do for us and have been doing for us before we've even realized it. Lord, be with us this morning. Allow us to wrestle with what these words mean within our own lives. That just as you sought out each individual disciple, you still seek out each and every single one of us so that the kingdom of heaven can come just a little step closer to being fully realized. Lord, be with us this morning. Be with us this morning as we move into our time of invitation that if any decisions need to be made or if any hearts need to be mended, Lord, I pray that we can do that during this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.